Glad you made it out. Again, if you get hot, we got fans in the back. We're going to be here a minute this morning. We got two chapters to cover. I know what you're thinking, Lee. You'll never get through. I have to get through. We have to get done with Daniel. We can't keep, can't keep going. Uh, so uh, Daniel chapter 10 is where we are going to start uh, this morning. We are going to work our way through Daniel 10 and 11. I know what you're thinking. Lee, Daniel 11 is the longest chapter. How are you going to do that? By sheer miracle, we're going to do it. All right, so uh, just a couple of things. Um, uh, our missionaries are back in town. Scott Newland left a couple weeks ago to, uh, to go to Peru and do some mission work uh, with a, a group from the area. We're, we're glad that he's back. He's not feeling well this morning. So, uh, but if you would just pray for him, and we're uh, grateful that he's back in town. John Combs was back in town from being gone all summer doing mission work overseas, and uh, so we're so grateful that he is back. He's um, uh, getting married in a couple days, and so uh, we're so grateful that he's back, but he, you will see him around. Uh, and if you do see him around, grab him, take him to lunch, and either one of them, and just ask, what did God do? Tell me about your trip. I'm sure they would be uh, uh, joyed to tell you about it. So this morning, we're going to start off in chapter 10. I'm going to read a little bit of chapter 10. We're going to flip to the next page, and we're going to read some of chapter 11. What I'm wanting to do is just to introduce these chapters to you. I cannot read all of them because you would, write, you would like to go to lunch. And so I'm going to read a little bit of them, and I'm going to uh, trust that you can go home and read the rest for yourself, and I'm going to do my best to kind of uh, 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 go through these. these. But these chapters um, uh, are, can be kind of sectioned off uh, as 10, 11, 12, as uh, uh, kind of all together, they, they kind of build off of each other. And so um, we're going to start in verse 1. Just read a few verses so we can uh, get some context here. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the word was true, and it was gr a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understood the vision. And in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine, entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arm and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but I great, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and, I, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with, with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set, set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man, greatly loved and understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this to me, I stood up trembling. And then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and, and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Now, if you would, just flip over to chapter 11. Let's begin in chapter 11, verse 1. Let's just read a little bit of chapter 11 so you get an idea uh, of these two chapters that we're going to walk through. Chapter 11, verse 1. And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. 
And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall rise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall rise, and who shall rule with great dominion, and do as he wills. And as soon as he had risen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the fourth winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. Then the king of the south shall be strong, but the one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule and his authority shall be a great authority after some years that shall make an alliance and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm and he and his arm shall not endure. But she shall be given up and her attendants, he who fathered her and he who supported her in those times. And from a branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place he shall come against the enemy and enter the fortress of the king of the north and he shall deal with them and shall prevail. He shall also call off Egypt, their, gar their gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold. And for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. Then later shall come into the realm of the king of the south but shall return to his own land. Now let's flip down uh, to this is not on your screen, but I want you to flip down uh, to verse 36. 36 kind of begins, uh, 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 well, we'll talk about it in a minute. It begins to talk about some other king. And let's read just a few of those verses. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is decreed shall be done he shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women he shall not pay attention to any other god for he shall magnify himself above all he shall honor the god of, of fortresses instead of these a god with whom his fathers did not know he shall honor with gold and silver with precious stones and costly gifts he shall deal with the strongest fortress with help of a foreign god those who acknowledge him he shall load with honor he shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price and and at the time of the end the king of the south shall attack him but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships and he shall overcome into countries and shall overflow and pass through now flip to the end of the chapter verse 45 and he shall pitch his uh, palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we pray that as we dive into these two chapters, Lord, that you would just so help us. That you would help us to hear and understand and Lord sometimes when we walk through these passages they we, we can get lost in the details and some of what would be to us history but Lord may your spirit bring clarity to what you are teaching through these passages we pray this in Jesus name amen so in chapter 9, we see that Daniel is praying. He is praying as he usually does. In that, he is reading the scriptures, realizes that the 70 years that Jeremiah prophesied about is almost up. It's time for the, the exiles to be uh, returned home and and he's praying and he's repenting and he's confessing and he's uh, crying out to the Lord, will you do these things? And then we see in chapter 9 that God sends Gabriel and says to Daniel, yes, your prayers will be, your immediate prayers will be answered. 
Yes, I will send my people back to their homeland. But yet, it's not just your immediate prayers, it's your ultimate prayers. It's, the, it's not just your immediate concern, it's your ultimate concern that I will, I will answer those prayers. I will, and I will save you from your ultimate enemy, and that is sin. So we come to chapter 10, and again, Daniel is praying. He is praying and fasting. And as we dive into this chapter, I'm just going to dive in feet first, all right? So if we're looking at this passage, we have to understand when we're looking and thinking about life that prayer is essential to fighting the war that we are in. We come to this, this chapter 10 and we understand throughout all of the prophecies of Daniel, there are a lot of battles. There are a lot of wars. This kingdom is going to be taken over by this kingdom, and this is going to be taken over by this kingdom, and there's going to be destruction, there's going to be fighting, there's going to be bloodshed, there's going to be people that follow after these foreign, I mean, these pagan kings, and there's going to be people that, that, that kings that run over the believers of God. There, there's just going to be a battle. And, and, and through this, we know that Daniel is thinking about all of these destructions and all of these things that are coming. And so we, again, we find Daniel on his knees praying, fasting to hear from God. And so prayer is essential in fighting the war that we are in. Does anybody feel that we're in a war these days? If you're a believer, you should feel this war. You say, well, Lee, I don't know what you're talking about. There's, I don't hear any bombs blowing up. I don't hear any guns going off unless I'm in the country and it's target practice day. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. What, what, what war are you talking about? We're, we're, nobody's bombing us. But for the believer, we are at war. We are always at war against our flesh, against the devil, against sin. We are at war. And oftentimes we think that here's the, here, here's the ways. I, I've got to deal with the war that I'm in. And we start listing those out. And then what we see Daniel saying is, this is how you deal with war this is how you deal with spiritual battle, and it's on your knees. But listen to what he says in verse 12. God is, uh, 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 Daniel's praying, and a, a word comes, and it says, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. God hears the prayers of the humble. God hears the prayers of the humble. We don't come to God and, and step into the holy of holies and say, yo, what up, God? I'm here again. I know you've been waiting on me because I got some important things to tell you. God would go, Look, let me take you down a couple notches. Because you don't walk into my presence with pride in your heart. You walk into my presence humble. Back in the day, they had a temple. And in that temple, there was different sections of the temple place where you made sacrifice, the holy place. And then we had the holy of holies. And that was where the high priest went once a year. And when he would go in, they'd tie a rope to him with bells on it. So if he didn't do it in the right way, if he was impure or, or prideful in any way in making sacrifices for the sins, the atonement of the people, that it, God would, would strike him dead. And that they heard the bells, what would they do? They'd pull him out. What a reminder, right? As you're walking in, jingle, jangle. It's not Christmas time. It's time to humble myself before a holy God 
because I'm about to go in the presence of the almighty king of kings, Lord of lords. Daniel was humbled before the Lord. And so we have to ask the question, who, who, who does the Lord listen to? What prayers does the Lord listen to? The prayers of the humble, the prayer of the broken and the contrite. Psalms 51 says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. We as followers of Christ do not go before the Lord in pride, but humble awareness of who we are compared to the Almighty King. And Daniel understood this, and so he prayed. He was humbled in the presence of a holy God. We will be humbled. Listen to some of the ways in which we see this humility. Verse 8, it says that no strength was left in me. I retained no strength. Verse 9, I fell on the ground in a deep sleep. My face was on the ground. I was laying prostrate before the Lord. I, in verse 11, I stood up trembling. Verse 15, I turned my face toward the ground and I was mute. Sometimes we feel like we go to God with boldness means we go to God and we begin to tell him all the things in which he should do. But we can go to the Lord with boldness. No, no, no. That boldness means that you can now, because of Christ, split that curtain from top to bottom. You can go boldly into the Holy of Holies, humbled. Because you're entering into a holy place. And we see that, that Daniel was humble. But God desires that when his people are in his presence, that we can be strengthened by him and for him. Not just that we are humbled, but then afterwards that we are strengthened by him. Daniel finally speaks in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 10 and says, How can I speak? I have no strength. Then the Lord touched him and said to him, O oh man, greatly loved. How about it, men? Wouldn't you love for someone to come up and say, you are a man loved by God? Wouldn't you love for just God to just squeeze you a little bit and say, you are my beloved? Don't look at me, man. I, I know you're flexing your muscles like, I don't need anybody to do that for me. But in the quietness of your truck, in the loneliest and hardest of darkest of days, you just need someone to say, I love you. And in those moments, Daniel had God say, Oh, Daniel, you are loved. And then he goes on and says, Fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. Those should be words that when you hear the Lord say those to you, you should be strengthened. Amen? You, you, if those things were said to you on your darkest of days, in the, the most humbleness of times, you would be strengthened because you know the Lord is with you. Daniel heard these words and it strengthened him and he was ready to hear what God had to say. Sometimes we need to be strengthened. We need God to strengthen us through his word before we can hear his word. Sometimes we need God to just say, I love you. Do not fear now I've got something I want to teach you. But sometimes we're so busy, we're so blocked out by all of the fear and all of the anxiety and all of the things that we have, we need to humble ourselves by, because of God's word so we can hear God's word. So the next thing I want us to see out of chapter 10 is that the battle that we face cannot be fought on our feet. It must be fought on our knees. 
You say, Willie, that's the same thing as what you just said. No, it's not. I use different words. The battle that we face cannot be fought on our feet. And this is how we try to fight our battles. In a good stance. Come on. Come at me. I'm ready. You've had those. You've, you've done those exercises. Some, you put your feet like this. Someone push you and you fall down. Then they say, well, spread your feet apart. Now push me. And, and, and oh, yeah, I'm strong now. That's how we've been taught to fight. Nobody ever said, get on your knees and fight. We, like Daniel, know that the future is not going to, all, to be all roses and tulips. But we do know that God will never leave nor forsake his people. He told us this early in, in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 31. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. God hasn't answered my prayers with Gabriel coming to tell me of the coming Messiah. But he has heard the prayers of his people. We don't need Gabriel. Amen? <laughs> Got you too. First service went, I don't know if to say amen on that one. We don't need Gabriel to deliver messages to us. We don't need Michael. We got Jesus. We got the Son of God delivered to us, came to us, gave us his word, wrote it down, and said, Now, here is my word for you. Stop waiting on Gabriel. Stop waiting on some angel to come tell you what the Lord wants you to do. He came. He, we don't need Gabriel. We got Jesus. And Jesus said for us to pray, to fight. We have his very words. So when you pray, humble yourself. Pray like David. Acknowledge God's greatness, confess your sins, and pray that his will be done, not yours. So then we move into chapter 11. Now chapter 11 is one of the longest and most difficult chapters to understand. It speaks of kings in many locations. It talks of the rise and the fall and the destruction that they cause. And for Daniel, this kind of vision and, 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 and prophecy is not new. He, he's already interpreted visions for Nebuchadnezzar and his own visions of showing coming kingdoms and destructions that they will have. But this vision goes a little farther than the rest. He said chapter 10 through 12 are, are all kind of connected. And so what we see is is Daniel praying, getting this word from Gabriel, and then we see this vision in chapter 11 of these north and south kingdoms and the conquering of this king and this king falling and it being divided into the four winds and then this daughter doing this and this king being submitted. And you just see all this. And if for us, it can feel like, okay, I, I didn't sign up for a history lesson. So for us, we have the benefit of living post most of chapter 11. All the things that happened in chapter 11, we have seen play out. Uh, most of the things in chapter 11, we've seen play out throughout history. But Daniel's looking at it, and he's, he's living in it, and it is, a, it is a vision, it is a prophecy for him and his people. And for us, it is a look back and to see what, what Daniel was given and how it all played out over time. And so through this, as this all unfolded, this vision, this prophecy details many things that are written out in, in the events of history. But Daniel didn't know this. 
It was all to be in the future. But God gave these details for the people of God to be warned, but also comforted. You say, well, explain that, Lee. How can this be a warning and a comfort? Well, we see this is a warning because the future we, uh, is, is shown to us in chapter 11 over and over and over. And in chapter 9, and in chapter 8 and 7, and in chapter 2 and 1 with the visions of Nebuchadnezzar and, 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 and dreams of Daniel, we see that the future for God's people is going to be rough. There will be a lot of bloodshed. And Jerusalem is going to be stuck in the middle of all of it. So, be warned, Daniel. Be warned, people of God. These kings will come. And some may offer peace. Some may offer prosperity. And, and many will convince, would be convinced that this guy is the answer. But he's not. They will be deceived. Even some of your own people, Daniel, will be taken up into these kingdoms of this world and they will be eventually destroyed. The same could be said for us. There are politicians and political parties and governments and regimes that offer peace and prosperity. But for us as believers, we've read about the kingdoms of the world and we know their end. We as believers should not hitch our trailers to any party, to any political person, to any regime. Our trailer is hitched to the kingdom that will last forever. Because all kingdoms of man will come to an end. And so this is a warning to you, Daniel. This is a warning. Bloodshed is coming. Your people will suffer more. This is a warning. Well, you say, well, well Lee, I, I don't think Daniel lived through all of this. I don't think he lived through Alexander the Great and Antichus the Fourth and the Roman Empire. I, 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 don't, I don't think Daniel lived through all of that, Lee. So how in the world is, is all these generations beyond him going to hear about this? Well, Daniel's going to write it down, and he's going to give it to his people, and his people must read it and be warned and tell, of their, tell their kids, you must be warned, this is coming. This is coming. This is coming. So that you do not fall. So that you do not give in to these kingdoms of man. Christians, look at me. I don't know if anybody in the generation before you told you but let me be that one that told you that the future, it does not look very peaceful for the Christian. It will get rough. You say, well, how do you know this, Lee? Well, I read Daniel, and I read Jesus. And Jesus said, blessed are you when they persecute you. And they speak all manner of evil against you falsely. Blessed are you when you are abused and persecuted and killed for my sake. Listen to me. You have been warned. Don't think that the world out there wants what you have. They want to silence you. Because what you speak is a truth that they don't want until they hear it. And then when they hear that this truth is really truth, that they can be saved from their greatest and ultimate enemy, and they can live everlasting in, 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 in a place that is called heaven, they'll want what you have. 
But until then, the world will try to snuff you out. So be warned. Amen? Teach your children to be ready to fight by being on their knees. But we also should be comforted. We also should be comforted by these words. Each king mentioned in chapter 7, 8, 9, 11, and the ending, they, they, they all have an ending. Each of these kings have an ending. Look at the end of chapter 11. What does it say? And this king will die and there will be no one with him. Each kingdom will have an ending. Some will spend many years in a tyrannical terror, but their kingdoms will fall. Alexander the Great, what about him? Was he great? He died at 33. Antichrist the fourth, what about him? He died. What about the Syrians and the, the Egyptians and the, the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans? What about all of those kingdoms? What happened to those kingdoms? They came to an end. But the kingdom of God will stand forever. Chapter 11 tells of some of the king's kingdoms by name. But a majority of the chapter, it doesn't name the kings or the kingdom. Daniel is just given a description. Those descriptions are so detailed that those who came after Daniel would be... They, they, would, they would say, I, I, I don't think that these were written before the events. These must have been written after the events take, had taken place. There's no way that this type of detail could be known beforehand. But we say, oh, contraire. God knows all things. And he gave all details so that the people of God could know that these things are coming. Be warned. But also know that when these things are happening, you can be peaceful. You can be comforted knowing that this too shall what? Shall pass. It, chapter 11 speaks of the north. The, the, the battle of the, 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 the kingdom of the north, the kingdom of the south. We see that they will battle for years to come. But there would be one that would come that would be worse than any of these. We pick up in verse 21, and scholars agree that this king, this is the, this is the individual that is known as Antichus IV, or Antichus Epiphanes, which means that he, was, he saw himself as God. He was such an evil ruler to all, but specifically took out his rage on the Hebrew people, on Israel. Antichus was so bad that he, he is compared to the man of lawlessness or the beast in Revelation or to some as known as Antichrist. God warned his people of this man. He is coming. Be prepared. Antichrist was not the final Antichrist, but he was definitely a king who disregarded all of what God said or decreed. He was king, and he thought he was God. But we see from our perspective what happened to Antichus IV. He is dead. And Christianity lived on. But what happens in verse 36? Verse 35 and 36, scholars said that there's a gap there. And 36 begins to speak of a king that no other king has been able to fulfill these things. And so there's a shift. A shift that we can see begins to describe one that will come after these things. One that will be, that will be the final antichrist. The beast, the one who will try to take the last stand. For years, Christians have been fearful of the coming of 
of an antichrist. And in some regards, we should, we should have some concern for those who could be described as this one in Daniel 11. What we see in Daniel 11, 36 to the end, this is one bad dude that we don't want to mess with. He will persecute. He will destroy. He will murder. He will deceive. He will manipulate with no regard for mankind or any religion at all. Others will stand against him in battle, but he will win. Might is right will be his slogan. He will take over with sheer power. This is not just with military it's not just with a military strong arm. He will strong arm every part of our of of lives through of society with education and policies and every other aspect. Some would say if this is the mindset, if this is the mindset then we know that it has not come from God above. This is anti Christ. But just as we see this rule begin, sudden and out of the blue, look at verse 45. It says, And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end. This one that the history says, he is going to be bad news. But look at what the end of the chapter says. Please, Take comfort in these words. This one will have an end. And it says, with none to help him. His kingdom, like all the others in the world, will come to an end. And in his end, there will be no one there to help him. He will be alone. Not, only, not alone in regards to those who, who got on board with his evil conquest, but alone in that there is no one in the world or in all of creation who can help him when his final day arrives. Remember, the Lord is the giver and the taker of life. So with all this, with this understanding of chapter 11, I want to, I I want to talk about a few things. And, and I know what you're saying, Lee. You, it, it, we're, we're already a good, good, good portion into our service today. I know, but you, there's, you ain't got nowhere else to go. There's not a third service. So let's just buckle in. I told you, it's going to be a long one. And they're all ours just to help you, all right? First thing that we should see through this, through these chapters, is that we should repent. If we can't look at 9, 10, and 11 and not be so overwhelmed that we should repent, then we are not reading it right. As Daniel is given these words to his fellow people, there should, be, uh, there, there should have been this collective moment, a, a season of mourning and repentance. It's their sin that has caused all of this to happen. They didn't obey. They turned to other gods. They had a chance to avoid this, but chose not to follow the Lord. The same should be said for us. When we hear this, there should be a moment of mourning for the sins of our forefathers. But I know what you're thinking. All this is in the past. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect me now. Sure it does. We live in a world plagued by sin and its effect. Disease, abnormalities, crime, poison, maliciousness, all are the product of sin. This is not how God wanted it to be. And we're living with the consequences of these sins. You say, what are those consequences? Well, we still have tyrants, don't we? They're not extinct. Evil is still at work. The heart of man that has not been turned to Christ is still evil and is running as fast as they can to gain as much power as they can. And if Christianity gets in their way, they will do whatever they can to silence it. But let me remind you that they cannot silence the church. Jesus said, and I, I trust Jesus. Jesus said, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But knowing this, 
We must repent of our sin, our greed, our compromise that has assisted in the advancement of an anti-Christ kingdom. John the Baptist's message when he was before, uh, before Jesus started his ministry, his message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Our message should be the same. Repent because Christ is coming again and this time is the last time. He came first as a meek, as meek and mild. His next coming will be mighty and conquering. Whose team are you going to be on? The one who wants to destroy the world and cares nothing about you or the one who wants to save the world and cares so much about you and has died so that you may live. What team are you going to be on? So we need to repent. Amen? We need to turn from our sin. Second, we need to resist. We look at verses 30 through 32. We see that that this king, probably Antichus, gains a foothold. Christians are called to live as Christ in this world, to be loving, faithful, kind, meek, patient, gentle. But this doesn't mean that we have to give our lives over to evil and, and, and all who practice it. We are called to resist, resist sin in all ways, in every aspect of our lives. We resist it in our communities and in our world. We must. James chapter 4 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. We cannot let the reality of evil, of evil empires, break us to a place of submission to their plans and their philosophies, we must resist. Evil cannot gain, uh, Sinclair, Sinclair Ferguson says this, evil cannot gain a foothold in the city of God unless it finds the spirit of cooperation among the visible people of God. You want me to read that again? Evil cannot gain a foothold in the city of God unless it finds a spirit of cooperation among the visible people of God. It is not inevitable that the church should be corrupted by the world. There must be a willingness or a blindness in the church before this happens. This is true at three levels of our lives, doctrinal, moral, and spiritual. Where there is a compromise in any of these areas, weakness and failure follow. All three must be guarded with care. Do you not see that this is happening even in our world today? They are attacking our doctrine. Surely that cannot be true. They are trying to get you to compromise your morals and say, surely that can't be correct. And then it's, they're trying to attack your spiritual life and say, it's all hogwash. All we have is human. All we have is what we can see. But it is our job to resist and to say doctrine of the scriptures is true. No matter what you say, this is truth. We should have moral clarity in a day that is trying to get you to have moral chaos. We should be the ones to say, this is clear. And we should be the ones living a life that is strong in our spiritual, in, in our spiritual life because we understand that, that our lives are not built, are not made up of just flesh but of spirit we must resist the ways of the world in our lives in our churches in our families we don't have to be extreme about this to where we're not in the world but we must not be of the world 
You say, well, Lee, what does it mean to resist? Resist implies an overt recognition of a hostile or threatening force and a positive effort to counteract or repel it. So we see something that is wrong, that is that they're trying to to break these things down, we resist. We don't just start yelling and pointing fingers and saying that is wrong. No, we counter at, we counterbalance it with what is right and true and good and doctrinally sound, morally clear and spiritually alive. Resist does not mean starting a revolution and start burning down buildings. God's kingdom is not a kingdom taken by force. It's a kingdom that grows through the gospel, through a spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers, over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up what? The whole armor of God, so that you can do what? Resist. So that you do not succumb to the ways of the world. We resist. But we also need to be refined. In this process, God is refining his people. Daniel sees in his visions many kingdoms come and go. God's people are suffering and hurting. But it's through all of this and the coming of the Antichrist that refine his people. Look at verse 35. And some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be what? Refined, purified, and made white, uh, white until the time of the end. For it still awaits the appointed time. Refinement is hard. Anybody ever go through a refinement period in your life? You still got scars, don't you? It hurts. It's hard. It's the process of pulling out the bad parts and keeping the good, letting the good rise. Refined by, the, by Webster says, to refine something such as metal, sugar, oil from impurities or unwanted uh, uh, materials. It is to free those unwanted things from those materials. Refinement spiritually is taking everything out of you that looks like you and keeping all that looks like Christ. This whole time, God has been saying to me, following me, I'm your king. I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. I'll save you. He's saying this to all of us. And you would think after seeing some of the things that these tyrants do, that no one would 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 want to be remotely associated with them. And they would want to do anything for God, for Christ. But the scripture says some will. Some will, uh, some of the wise will stumble, but all, not all, but some, and this is to refine them. The Lord may allow the world to beat up on his people but only so that on the other side we will be stronger and more faithful. One religious leader a few years ago said this, all of this that's going on in our world today is the death of casual Christianity. And I sure hope so. If you were only casually a Christian, meaning you only do Christian things when it's convenient or profitable for you, then you will be refined out. You will be scraped off the top like dross off the top of gold. The battles that Daniel is seeing and the, and, and the leaders are seeing that, that Daniel is warning his people and us about require a faith that is steadfast. A follower who is not a fair weather fan. Would you look at me for a second? There is no time for fair weather Christians in our day. Oh, I'm, I mean, I, I go to church on Sunday, but the rest of the week, I'm just like everybody else in the world. We don't have any time for that, amen? The world's had enough of that. 
The world needs to see what a Christian looks like from Sunday to Sunday. And to see the hope that we carry. The peace that comes. The comfort that we have when it feels like the sky is falling. We are not the ones running around saying, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. We're the ones saying, oh God, you are in control over all things. I'm scared out of my mind, but I have peace knowing that this kingdom and this thing has an end. And if it's the end of my physical life, it is not the end of my life. Then that, the next thing that we should do is reclaim. We must resist, but we grow in our refinement, but we also reclaim what is God's. The fight for power will be in the avenues of life that will affect you and me. It will be in the family. It will be in schools. It will be in marriages. It will be in the workplace. The battle seems big and almost like it will, it will never it will never happen to us. It's, it's just out there somewhere. It won't affect us. But can I remind you, can I bring some light into that thought is that it will affect you. We see a battle. We see that it is fought in Jerusalem, but the battle won't stay there. It never has. It, it's never just isolated to one place. The evil one seeks to gain as much control as he can. So if he can, get, if he can get to Disney or Bluey or Garfield or sitcoms or kids' video games or your de definition of marriage or what you think about church or what you think about the Bible, he will. And it is up to us to reclaim those areas of our lives for the truth of the gospel. It's up to us how you say by prayer by praying Daniel modeled this they weren't able to 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 make Daniel become part of the Babylonian ways of thinking because Daniel prayed they weren't able to persuade him to bow down and to not give honor to God because Daniel was close to God he prayed so must you and I. We must pray. Not to tell God how to carry out his plan, but for us to, to be close to the one who has the plans, to be close to the one that has the flashlight in the darkest of days. Sometimes it feels like the days are getting darker. How about we get closer to the one holding the flashlight? Who knows the way? And that we should teach. We should pray and we should teach. Look at verse 32. He shall, it says that he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Now, isn't that an encouraging verse? Amen? Those who know their God. Let me ask you, do you know your God? Let me ask you, let me phrase it a different way. Do you know the God of this world or do you know the God of heaven? Do you know the, do you know the God who sent his son to die for your sins? You say, what is this action though? If we know God, what is this action? Reclaiming what is rightfully God's. What is God? All, what is God's? All of it. So we teach, we tell of how God foretold this and that we have to prepare ourselves for deception, for the false teachings, for the manipulations, for the fear tactics. We have to teach all those who believe who God is, what he said, and the hope that he sent in his son Jesus. We must teach, we must train and proclaim the gospel to counter the lies and the evil that this world is spewing the gospel is truth. And many are looking for truth in this world of lies. They will look for it in many ways and come up empty. So Christian, reclaim truth by teaching the good news of Jesus. 
by studying and knowing the word of God. We reclaim by praying and teaching the next thing that we should remember. Ian Duga says, our, our view of history is foundational to the way we live. If history is an assortment of random circumstances coming from nowhere and going nowhere, then faithful, sur- faithful suffering has no possible meaning. If it, is, if it is a wasted life that could have been better spent on pursuing pleasure instead. But if history is actually following God's predetermined course to a final end, then our actions are filled with meaning. Any sacrifice, sacrifices that are demanded of us will be made more than worthwhile by our hope of glory on the last day when the dead shall rise. We should remember what Christ has done. We should remember how God has saved his people from so many perils and how he saved you from your ultimate enemy, and that is sin. May we never forget. Amen? We should remember because that makes our current day, our current sufferings mean something. Our last thing that we should do, the last R, is that we should rejoice. Verse 45 says, Yet he shall come to an end. Evil has an end. Would you let that sink in for just a minute? Evil has an end. Rejoice because it comes through Jesus Christ. The end of evil, it comes through Jesus Christ. Where have you hitched your your wagon to? The kingdoms of this world or the everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ? Do not look into the future with fret and fear, but look to it to be warned and comforted. Amen? Jesus, we love you. We're grateful for what you've done for us. We pray that you would help us to see your words, to be warned by them, but to be comforted. Let us stand strong in our doctrine, in our morals, in our spiritual walk with you. May the world see hope in us because we find our hope in you. May we proclaim the good news. May we not stop proclaiming because we understand that that is how we can reclaim what is rightfully yours. We pray that your kingdom come, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time.